So there's uh, two main threads um, kindly provided by uh, Tony then. One was the, um, the skin replacement, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And the other one was the runaway stage, which is, uh, that was method B. That's, that's me. I'm unfortunately another one of those surgeons. Um, in fact, I'm a, I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. And uh, plastic surgeons uh, are obsessed with restoring form and function in their patients. Uh, take this patient, for example. This patient has a large tumour on the right side of her face. If you excise that tumour, how are you going to restore form and function to this patient? My mentor, Professor Ian Taylor, is an eminent plastic surgeon in Australia, pioneered this uh, radical concept at the time. It's called uh, free flap surgery. And essentially, the concept is you take a three-dimensional block of tissue with its blood supply, and that's a critical, critical part, and you transplant it from one side of the body to the other. So in this case, you take a, a small section of the, of the hip bone and you uh, transplant it to reconstruct the, the jaw. And the results can be really rather impressive. And because of the success in, in this type of surgery, Professor Taylor and his research team embarked on an intensive study. They spent thousands of hours injecting and dissecting cadavers to sort of map uh, the vascular territories of the body. They wanted to discover which three-dimensional territories of the body were supplied by which blood vessels so they could be used uh, in subsequent free flap surgery. And in fact, this human map that he created is used by reconstructive surgeons all around the world now in order to harvest tissues and transplant them. What this map also provided us with, uh, with something that anatomists and surgeons had known for some time. And in this particular image, you can see uh, marked in green peripheral nerves tracking very, very closely with, with blood vessels. Uh, we knew that this, this, this happened. We've, we've, we've actually got a term for it. that We call them neurovascular bundles. But we, we, didn't, we don't know why they actually travel together. So in order to try and answer that question, I uh, went back to, to embryology. This is when where all most of the uh, adult relationship, anatomical relationships are established. This is actually uh, an image of a bird embryo showing its, its vasculature. And while I was studying this embryology, looking here, you can see the nerves in green and the blood vessels in red and a developing limb, I became fascinated with the regenerative capacity of the embryo. The embryo has a capacity to heal without, scar without any scarring. Uh, and the other thing is that those animals that can actually regenerate entire limbs, they tend to reactivate or recapitulate the, the embryonic program. Another pioneer in, in re regeneration biology is Dr. Dave Gardner down at UC Irvine. And he's done some fabulous studies looking at the uh, comparisons of, of embryos, in this case of an axolotl seen under the generation side uh, on the left and uh, comparing the expression of certain molecules that you see in the regenerating limb. And interestingly, the, the blue indicates where a certain protein is being expressed. And when that limb is regenerating, we're seeing the same molecules being reactivated that are present during embryonic development. But unfortunately, uh, not all of us are axolotls or salamanders or embryos. Uh, and there's definitely a spectrum of wound healing. We know that young children have the capacity to regenerate their tips of their fingers, where adults don't. We know that some tissues, such as the oral mucosa, is much better at healing than the skin. And unfortunately, some of us just don't heal well at all, and we scar terribly. In fact, scarring is really the end game with many of the diseases that kill us today, such as stroke and myocardial infarction. The challenge is, how can we push healing away from scar and further towards regeneration? One of the big differences between animals that can regenerate and those that can't is the epithelium. This, is a, this series of images is a human model of, of wound healing, the human cells. And when you wound it in this model, the epithelium, the purple structure, starts to migrate across. And it eventually gets there, but it does it excruciatingly slowly. The other big difference is that the, re, the uh, epithelium in organisms that can regenerate signals to the underlying tissue, and it changes their character. It forms a, what we call a blastema. It's like a bunch of stem cells, and that's what actually regenerates. So the challenge is, how can we mimic this regenerative epithelium and induce regeneration or improve wound healing? This is an image of uh, some tissue that were produced. It's a living cellular construct that, if we can, maybe some hands some out. Uh, that, would be, that would be great. So we've got some 
um, tissue that we'd like to hand out to, to some people that would be like to handle it. It's, uh, it's alive. And I'd like you to take open the lid. I've actually um, peeled back, turned it over to enable you to actually lift it out and have a feel of it. There's actually living tissue. We're manufacturing living tissue that we now use on patients. Um, and don't worry, you won't grow an extra limb or anything if you, if you, if you put it on your skin. Um, anyway, so this, if we could go back to that last image, please. This image is a fluorescent image of, the, of that uh, living tissue that, that some of you have got in your hand. Uh, it's got two cell types. The red is the progeny of stem cells, um, and then the blue are nuclei uh, of another cell population. So the question is, can we use this uh, living cellular construct to sort of substitute uh, for a regenerative epithelium and signal to the tissue underneath? Can we, instead of waiting for the, the epithelium to migrate across, can we, can we put a patch on and, and allow this regeneration to occur? So we've conducted several large-scale clinical trials involving hundreds of patients, and we've shown that using this, this living tissue can actually increase the rate of healing uh, in, in patients, and that's clinically significant. So this is a series of images from a patient with a venous leg ulcer. And what's really exciting is that you can use this living cellular construct to actually change the trajectory of healing such that you see improvements in quality and you see return of pigmentation. And importantly, and this is the thrust of my talk, is that the living cellular construct, it's, it's quite a humble construct. It's not interested in itself. It's all about what it does to you. It's not substituting for skin. It's not replacing skin. It's inducing a regenerative response from the patient. It's all about what the patient can produce. And given our success in skin, we were, wanted to test to see if we could translate these findings into other tissues. So we've uh, looked at the, the oral mucosa. We've just finished another couple of, of clinical trials um, involving over 100 patients to see whether we can regenerate using this technology uh, in the oral cavity. This is a post-operative photograph. Before there was uh, mucosal defects, there was a wound on both sides. On the right-hand side, you can see something that looks like it's stuck to the side of the gum. Uh, it looks a bit like sushi. Uh, surprisingly, that's standard of care. That's actually a painful procedure where you take tissue from the roof of the palate and graft it. On the, uh, the right-hand side, you don't see anything at all, which is precisely the point. That's using this uh, living cellular construct to induce regeneration. It's not about what it replaces or substitutes for it. It's about what it, what it induces. It's about producing new tissue by the patient themselves de novo. So we haven't conquered the holy grail of regeneration. We're not even close to it. But we really think that we've pushed wound healing a little bit further to the right, away from scar and towards regeneration. And that's pretty significant indeed. And just to, just to close out with the idea bite about where does replacement skin come from, well, it comes from all of you. Thank you.